expectations for the ways that we're used to engaging through the arts with our audiences? How do we build a shared vision for creatives so that we can move forward together? We're all navigating a huge amount of uncertainty right now, but one thing is certain. Art and creativity need to be a central part of Vermont's recovery. The Vermont Creative Network is committed to advancing that conversation. We formed a creative sector response and recovery team that will be advising the governor's economic mitigation and recovery task force. The aim of that team is to ensure that the needs and the challenges and the assets of the creative sector are understood and taken into account as we plan together the safe reopening of Vermont's economy. And we convened today's forum to ensure that those of you in the creative sector have a chance to contribute to, the, to that broader discussion about what recovery is gonna look like for Vermont communities. And so that our state legislators and policymakers can hear from you what you're experiencing. And so they can share with all of us the resources that are available to the arts and culture sector and share their reflections about what they think lies ahead. So now it is my great pleasure to turn things over to Representative Sarah Coffey. Sarah is serving in her second year, representing the towns of Vernon and Guilford in Wyndham County in our state legislature. And many of you also know Sarah as an innovative nonprofit arts leader. She led the Vermont Performance Lab um, for many years. Sarah, thank you for your leadership and for contributing to today's conversation. And now over to you. Thank you, Karen and, um, and Amy, and it's really amazing to know that there are over 450 people on this call today. So um, I just want to acknowledge the amazing work that's being done by the Vermont Arts Council to respond, um, getting grants out uh, in this emergency uh, situation, and also for organizing a panel, a virtual panel like this during this time. So I'm, not, I'm gonna keep my words brief because there's a lot of information that we hope to share and a lot of stories that we um, wanna hear. Um, and as, we begin, as we're beginning to emerge from the worst period of this COVID-19 pandemic, it's um, the equally frightening companion, the economy is starting to take center stage. So we envision this form as an opportunity to bring state economic leaders and policymakers together with the creative community um, to do a lot of listening and to share our updates. And so that the creative sector is um, part of our conversations as we plan for our economic recovery. And I just wanna say, I'm so appreciative um, for the artists and the uh, arts leaders and um, the policymakers and state leaders who are working on how we're going to reopen. Um, so, and, and I also want folks to know that there are many legislators who are, are on this call and in the legislature, um, uh, many of us care deeply about um, the creative sector and the value of our creative economy. So in addition to um, Senator Becca Ballant from Wyndham County and Representative um, Stephanie Jerome um, from Brandon, who will be speaking uh, later in this call, I just wanted to acknowledge a few of the other legislators who are here with us. Um, John Kalaki from South Burlington, Representative Scott Campbell from St. Johnsbury, Representative Sarita Austin from Colchester, Representative Randall Zott from Barnard, Representative Peter Anthony from Barrie, and Representative Carrie Dolan from Waitsfield, um, representing a, you know, communities across the state. Um, um, I'm so grateful that we're here together. Um, I believe that Vermont's creative sector is uniquely positioned to take a strong role in not only rebuilding our economy, but in re-envisioning an economy that's resilient and vibrant and one that brings vitality to our downtowns and village centers, provides good and secure jobs and successful businesses um, while addressing environmental and social concerns um, that are integral to the infrastructure of our communities. Um, so I believe we can best do this by working together. And I, along with my colleagues, I know we're gonna be doing some deep listening. Um, and um, thank you all so much for being here today. And I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Amy. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Um, as we jump into this, what we're experiencing section of the, of the forum, I am gonna throw up another quick poll. Um, if I know how to do that, here we go. Um, just a um, quick snapshot again of how folks in the creative sector 
uh, are feeling and um, what's keeping you up at night and what's making you hopeful. Um, so I'll just take a minute for, um, for folks to chime in on that poll. Um, if I think I have successfully launched it, yes. Um, and I'll just also remind folks um, to use the Q&A function is really great for um, chiming in with questions and then liking them to send them up. If you wanna get into the, the chat function will, will work better for you um, for, uh, for conversations. Um, so lots of great interaction happening on this forum. I really appreciate everybody's involvement. And um, I'll share uh, Reed Prescott's six words, excited, positive, overwhelmed with the possibilities. I think that uh, sums up things for a lot of folks. So um, the Q&A section again is for uh, the questions for the speakers um, and then the chat um, for any general comments um, or conversation among attendees. Okay, and we've got um, a whole lot of people who have responded. And I'm just gonna leave it up for another 10 seconds or so just to get a snapshot so we can move into our conversations. We're gonna hear from uh, four members of Vermont's creative sector. Um, Vermont's creative sector is just so diverse and interesting and um, four people, of course, do not capture the richness of it. But um, I, I think um, we're really grateful uh, to these four folks for sharing uh, their reflections on the current challenges what lies ahead and, and what they think uh, needs uh, is needed for the creative sector and how the creative sector can be a part uh, of Vermont's recovery. Um, and I'll just share quickly, transcend back to normal, embrace forward to exceptional. So lots of interesting, very optimistic um, things happening. And I'm seeing someone uh, mentioning some issues with the sound. And so I'll just ask my, colleagues to chat with me directly if you see any more issues regarding that. So thanks for your participation in that poll and we'll share out on that at the end um, uh, of this section. But I want to um, lift up uh, Maria Basescu, who is the Managing Director of Yellow Barn. Maria. Hi, thank you, Amy. Thanks, I'm glad to be here. I'm grateful to you and Karen and the Arts Council and I have to say, I'm very, very glad I live in Vermont right now for many reasons. Um, but one of them is the leadership of the governor and uh, everyone who's working in state government and certainly in the creative sector. So with Yellow Barn, which is a, an international chamber music center based in Putney, we're able to respond in a couple of different ways to the current crisis. And one thing we're doing is taking our traveling stage on the road around the state. It's called the Yellow Barn Music Hall. That's spelled H-A-U-L. And uh, it is a, a, it was a U-Haul truck that Yellow Barn purchased several years ago and worked with an architect named John Rossi, who has a company, uh, Massachusetts, was a founder of a Massachusetts-based company called Visible Good that makes rapid shelter deployment in various crisis situations. Anyway, we retrofitted this truck. It is uh, capable of being a live performance venue, but we can also play recorded music. And so we've been taking it to nursing homes and retirement communities and hospitals and food distribution sites, working in coordination with the school district to play everything from Beethoven to the Beatles and Stevie Wonder and Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong, uh, and just to try to share music and up, uplift spirits um, for volunteers that are working at these places and staff certainly, and children and families that are coming through and picking up food. And it uh, seems to be a wonderful way to connect with people and lift spirits. We take recommendations for if people have requests where they want to see the music hall go to honor individuals or organizations and we're getting a lot of those so um our our hope is later in the summer depending on social distancing guidelines we'll be able to bring some live music to, as well through the state with this uh, but we'll have to wait and see about that 
Another thing that Yellow Barn is doing is the artistic director, Seth Knopp, is designing a program uh, in honor of Beethoven's 250th birthday that will allow for walks in the woods in solitude where people will be able to go on these guided walks and see over a hundred reproductions of original Beethoven manuscripts spread throughout the woods and be able to hear at various listening places the soundtrack of uh, Beethoven music. And also for the summer, Seth is creating a series of artist residencies that are adapted to the current guidelines. So musicians will be accommodated in quarantine, living in quarantine, rehearsing while social distancing, and streaming performances from our Big Barn performance venue, live streaming those performances. And we're also transitioning our Young Artist program in June to a three-week virtual program. So um, we're happy that we're able to find these ways to stay connected, connect our musician community, support our greater community. Um, and of course, at the same time, there's no getting around the fact at all that this has a severe economic impact for our organization and our community. Normally in the summer, we're bringing thousands of people to the, not only hundreds of musicians, but thousands of uh, audiences, visitors to the state who are buying tickets and supporting the local economy in the range of ways through housing and food and so on. And uh, so we're, we're obviously very concerned about how we're going to work together to lift out of this and move forward safely um, and, and be as creative a part of that solution as we can be. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, now I am going to turn it over to Amber Arnold. Sorry, I'm, uh, can you hear me now? Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Amber Arnold, uh, who's a multidisciplinary artist uh, and also uh, does communications and outreach work with the Clemens Family Farm. So Amber. Hi. Um, thank you, everyone, and um, thank you for all the organizers of this event for including me on behalf of the Clemens Farm. Um, I guess the first thing that I want to say is that one thing that I think is important to center is just that on top of the challenges of COVID-19, the, the big underlying challenge for um, POC-led organizations and our Black artists is the, is the um, social inequities and the systemic racism that most of us face every day across the country. And um, I think it's becoming more clear for a lot of people that, you know, at this point, just being Black in this country is a crime with a lot of serious impacts. So that is kind of like the foundational challenge. And then on top of that, adding COVID-19 and, um, and how that has impacted our community has um, has been really huge. Um, and so what the Clemens Farm has been focused on at this point mostly is we, in March, we created a needs assessment to see um, where our artists were at and what they were needing. And we found that a lot of them had, like many artists, a lot of canceled gigs. They weren't having, um, they felt like they didn't have social support. A lot of them had a lot of anxiety and stress compiling on top of, you know, just like the racism and things they were facing and the COVID-19 crisis. So what we decided to do is focus most of our efforts on really looking at the ways that we could support our artists' emotional well-being and health and just really focus on that to help them um, really just feel loved and supported so that they could get back into the work that they're doing. Um, so we created what we call the Thriving Artists weekly Zoom call meeting where all of our artists get together and work on creative projects together, just talk about their experiences. And that's really helped shift the focus into like um, creating this like historical legacy that we've been working towards and how can we come together as a community to support each other to continue doing that even through this. Um, we reached out to the Vermont's Arts Council to 
see about pooling funds together and we've been able to raise enough funds to support um, a little under half so about like 40 of our 160 artists will be able to um, support with relief funds and that was a challenge that we were seeing with a lot of the um, grant funding was that because even though we are part of the global majority in our country we're considered a minority and so because there's so few of us in the art sector like receiving funds from some of these larger relief funds had been um, very challenging to do so we've been really trying to focus on uplifting our POC voices in Vermont and just you know bringing awareness that to really you know reopen and create the create a way that we can all thrive really has a lot to do with um, you know starting to center equity issues and and really looking at what that means and how we can kind of like level the playing field and create an environment where you know POC organizations that don't have um, which most of us don't have operating budgets or we don't have access to the same fundings or grant opportunities or things like that really creating a platform where we can also um, show up in that way. And yeah, that's, that's Thank it. you so much, Amber. I really appreciate you sharing that important perspective. And I am pleased to uh, hand it over now to Roger Clark Miller. Thank you. And you can hear me now, yes. Uh, thanks, first, it's been an honor to be on here with everybody, it's really, really great. Um, I'm 68 years old. I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan and moved to Boston in 1978. In 1979, I co-formed the Highland Mission of Burma, playing guitar and singing. In the late 1990s, I joined and co-led the silent film company group, the Alloy Orchestra, on keyboards. Roger Ebert said, Alloy Orchestra is the best in the silent films. Both groups toured extensively nationally and internationally. I moved to Guilford. Roger, I, I apologize. This is Amy. I'm just going to chime in. I think there may be papers or something that's rattling your microphone that's getting in the way. Could be it. That could be it. I'm kind of reading. Okay, I'll solve that. I moved to Guilford, Vermont in 2015, where my partner had earlier bought a house because I was priced out of Somerville, Massachusetts, where I live. In 2017, Mission of Burma folded and I felt a need to explore new directions. I conceived of an art installation combining a conceptual film I've been working on since 2012 and my modified vinyl conceptual art, which I initiated in 1984. I called Danny Lichtenfeld at the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center and he was mercifully game. I worked nonstop for two years on these ideas, spending a month working intensely on a Kickstarter to get the funds needed to create the work and supply myself with the equipment to create a series of related concerts. So there are four discrete areas of work. For my art installation, I completed my film, The Davis Square Symphony, and I conceptualized, outsourced, and finalized the five modified vinyl visual works and accompanying audio records and listening stations for the installation. This was ongoing and intense up until the last days before the installation was in fact installed, March 10th. The other two elements are completely different and are for the concerts related to the installation. Half the concert is my music for string quartet. I've had concerts at the New England Conservatory, Tufts University, and other places. This culminates in my new composition, Music for String Quartet and Two Turntables. Here I had to create and cut a record for the string quartet to play to, incorporating sounds from my modified vinyl work that's in the installation. The other half of the concert is my new dream interpretation music for solo electric guitar ensemble. With my Kickstarter money, I built an ensemble from scratch. Three lap seal guitars, numerous sound altering devices, and an intense looping device which repeats what I play, allowing me to become a solo complex ensemble. During this time, I also toured extensively with the silent film group, Alloy Orchestra. And then, the installation at BMAC opened on March 14th and was closed down the next day. All four of my new music concerts at the ICA Institute of Contemporary Arts in Boston, Mass MoCA, the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, Rhizome DC and Washington DC were vaporized. The LA Orchestra had seven spring shows booked including the Lincoln Center in New York, the San Francisco Silent Film Festival, the Roger Ebert Film Festival and others also vaporized. 
one of the biggest problems of being a performer in the era in the era of COVID-19 is that the more bodies you fit into a hall, the better. Often that's how one gets paid, and that's not so good now. So there are two issues here. One is that the shows are not happening, so my current ideas can't be presented or generate income. The other issue is that I now have no reviews or recordings of shows, so I can't use these to apply for grants in the fall season or generate interest to my show, my art, in concerts elsewhere in the US or Europe. But on the positive side, BMAC has extended the installation show into October, and I will be performing a virtual dream interpretation guitar concert under BMAC's auspices on May 29th. The Warhol Museum concert is currently slated to happen on October 21st, which would be great. We're hoping to put the other three concerts within the same time period as a string quartet needs to rehearse and learn the compositions. But will these concerts happen in October? Nobody knows. I still work as a guitar teacher via Skype, which I enjoy. I have two upcoming paid virtual concerts, the BM's AC and Rhizome DC, though the pay is not on the same scale as the shows lost during this time period. I live on a mountainside in Guilford, and despite being very sparsely populated, I have found a really strong community here. Friends a mile down the dirt road will be showing films on the side of their house this summer. I told them if they can show Buster Keaton's, Buster Keaton's 1928 classic silent film, The General, I will gladly perform my Alloy Orchestra score to it outdoors in the meadow. And I am very grateful to be getting financial help from the Vermont Arts Council and Vermont PUA. Add this to the $600 from the feds for the self-employed, and these things allow me to continue working on ideas and creating as an artist without giving way to despair. That was my story. Thank you so much, Roger. And um, up next, we have uh, Jody Freed, who is the Executive Director of Catamount Arts in St. Johnsbury. He also serves as the chair of our Vermont Creative Network steering team. Jody. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here at the Arts Center for the first time in a long time. Um, and I guess what I'd like to say is that from the standpoint of art centers like ourselves, the current situation is truly an existential threat. There's been a per perfect storm that we've experienced between closing our doors two months ago um, and the impact of social distancing, cutting down our programming and cutting off our programming. Um, so there's no earned revenue to the market crash and the impact that that has had on our donor pool to the philanthropy um, pivoting to essential services, which thus far the arts and culture have not um, fallen into the um, category of essential services, um, even though a lot of our organizations are doing that work. Um, and then the public solution that has come forward, is, you know, whether it's the PPP or the um, economic injury loans through the SBA or other um, solutions have primarily been focused around loans. Um, and for art centers, um, you know, debt is uh, not something um, that is realistic over the long term. Um, it's something at Catamount that we've struggled with for a long time anyway. And the thought of adding more debt um, is a real issue. Um, in terms of the, um, what have we been doing? Um, we, upon closing, we've partnered with our local healthcare organizations. We're helping them with the, communication and messaging. We're trying to do programs out in the community that deliver the message that folks need to stay at home and adhere to the public health um, measures that are being put out there. So we did a slam the curve film slam that we opened up internationally. We had 150 teams from around the world compete. We ended up with 80 films submitted. Um, it was really amazing and they were all filmed in people's homes. They're all of the public health measures were requirements um, for the families who participated. Um, we've created a PPE factory here and we, we've partnered with our local home health agency and we've been um, creating masks and other um, PPE gowns, um, scrubs, etc. Um, we've worked with our local home health agency to develop a, a program to address isolation um, with folks who are experiencing it as um, they are not leaving their homes and they're at the end of the long roads here in Vermont and are feeling isolated and experiencing the trauma related to that. Um, 
And then we've done an, a, a journaling program, again, to reach out to homes and allow people to express themselves um, about the um, COVID-19 pandemic and how it's impacting their lives and have a shared experience around that. And all of these things, I think, are, really should put us in the category of essential services. We're working in concert with our public health officials um, and we are doing um, and playing a major role in the um, response that's taking place and we're parent preparing for a recovery phase where I think the trauma, isolation, et cetera, is gonna really need the arts and creative sector to play a significant role. Um, and so the fact that we're not considered essential services to me is, is really a travesty and something that needs to get corrected. We've applied for 13 grants so far since the start of the um, pandemic. And thus far, we've received one of those uh, funding uh, from an organization out of New Hampshire. Um, and we're waiting on a few others, but um, most of the world of philanthropy is pivoted to directly service um, folks and their response around COVID-19 and essential services, which we don't fall in that category. The last thing I would just mention is the challenge for organizations like ourselves and many of our partners, whether it's Circus Smirkus, Kingdom County Productions, PAMFest, the Highland Center for the Arts here in the Kingdom, Friday Night Live, Wednesday on the Waterfront. We're all doing booking that goes out in very long periods of time. And so we spend um, anywhere from six to 12 months on average at Catamount doing our booking in advance and all of the planning around that. And without clear guidelines and an understanding as to how the spigot is going to get turned and how that's going to impact us, um, it's going to really significantly delay, if not make impossible, the ability to bring back the larger scale performing arts. So, um, and even the, the smaller to medium scale, um, as you're looking at trying to work with um, agents and their touring um, artists. So it's really critical that we get clear guidelines and an understanding um, what the variables are, what are the different pathways, what are the cutoffs in terms of the number of attendees that can attend at each of those different levels, um, and then how can we um, how can we then create different um, contingencies to meet those um, as an organization? So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Jody. Uh, that's great. And and touching that last point you're touching on is a, is a issue that is getting a lot of action in our Q and A and in our chat field on just the how we coordinate and uh, responsibly begin to plan for reopening and what the contingencies are and what the various scenarios are. And uh, so I'll say that there's still um, we're aware that that is a huge issue that we need to work together on, um, and we simply there's, there are simply uh, so many unknowns uh, still today. Um, so thank you uh, to our stories from the creative sector. Uh, I am going to uh, just share quickly um, participants' uh, responses to the polls. Um, and uh, we'll see, uh, probably unsurprisingly, how to stay safe and reopen, navigating the uncertainties, lost income that venues and organizations are facing, lost income that creatives are facing from creative work and creative events, and uh, a lot of obvious concern about long-term impacts to the economy. Uh, I'll also share on the hopeful side, um, uh, and there's been some great, that's been reflected uh, really beautifully in the chat on uh, folks uh, excited about opportunities for innovations um, and uh, really creative responses and the community connections and support that's coming from this really challenging time. So I will um, take just a minute, I wanna just put a placeholder in that really big important question about how we responsibly reopen together. Um, um, and I'm just looking now, lots of really great questions that I wanted to um, open up. Um, and I think uh, this touches on, I'm, I'm just gonna pitch this question to the the full panel, I, I have Amber in mind, but I'm, I'm very happy for, for any of you, I know you have thoughts on this about, um, this is a, a question from Sharon Fantel. 
artists, organizations, the entire creative sector have been operating within an under-resourced, inequitable, and taxed system. As we discuss how the creative sector should be a part of recovery efforts, how will we, be, how will we ensure sustained, equitable change for those artists and organizations who are struggling beyond the short-term support grants? Um, that is a big question, but I would uh, open it up to our four creatives uh, for some um, brief reflections on that. Um, I think for me, that's a question that we spend a lot of time looking at. And in my opinion, like the only way to create equity and the only way to get funds directly to people who are struggling the most and that need it are to fund the grassroots movements with the people who are of those demographics and who are involved and who have a very clear understanding of what equity means. Because most often, a lot of the funding goes into very resourced organizations. It goes into admin budgets. It goes into, you know, places where not much of those funds are actually going into the people's hands who need them because we don't have a clear understanding of what equity means and how we actually create equitable systems. So I think it's really about funding, you know, grassroots people and like people who are of those demographics we're talking about, creating spaces for them to be parts of those conversations and to have like real leadership roles where their voices can be heard and including them because a lot of times they're not part of the conversation they're just kind of like talked for thank you amber um unless any of our other um folks want to chime in i'm going to move into the the next round of panels and and uh we will circle back with with questions and, and get to more questions uh, as we go along um, so uh, on, the, on the what's happening front, we've invited um, policymakers and community leaders to share updates about um, the recovery efforts to date, uh, resources available. Um, and up first, we have Ted Brady, who is the Deputy Secretary of the Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much, Amy, and thanks to the Arts Council and the Creative Network. So the Agency of Commerce has been involved with uh, a couple of different factors here uh, related to the COVID-19 response. The most important things I want to touch on today are, uh, one is restarting the economy and talking about what you should expect when it comes to reopening the creative sector. Uh, two, uh, the Recovery Resource Center at the Agency of Commerce's webpage. And then three, just a quick update on a few of the tools that you could use uh, that many of you already know about. I've seen it in the chat function and the question and answer. A lot of people know about some of these tools, but I wanted to give you a couple of updates. So in the spirit of uh, telling you what I'm going to tell you, then actually telling you and then finishing it with telling you what I've told you, uh, let's start with restart. So I've seen a few questions out there about what does it look like? Well, the, the Agency of Commerce is working uh, with the Governor's Economic Mitigation and Recovery Task Force, which is an advisory panel uh, and they have a Restart Vermont action team on that panel. It's made up of six or seven C-level executives from across the state. Uh, and we've assigned Sasha Mayer, who's the uh, one of the founders of Mamava, uh, a, bus a business up in Burlington that's been quite successful, to be the primary liaison with the Arts Council uh, and with uh, other cultural uh, organizations to try to talk about the arts and culture sector and how we're going to reopen that. And that's been talking to... Uh, a lot of people asking for input about how they think they could do a phased reopening. When we talk about reopening the economy, uh, you look at the far left and the far right of a, uh, of a timeline, <laughs> and you realize that on the far right are the things we're going to get to last. And that, that obviously is going to be uh, travel with no restrictions and large events, the several thousand or several hundred people events. When you look on the left, you see the stuff we've already opened, which is everything from the uh, outdoor work to construction to some manufacturing. And then you say, well, where do we fit in the middle? And I think that's where a lot of the work you all do fits, right? Many of you can get back to work much sooner on that spectrum because you might work alone or might uh, have ways to mitigate uh, work. So you probably saw the governor today announced that uh, retail will be reopening non-essential retail will be reopening as of uh, May 
15th and Monday. Well, perhaps some of you can get back there, but then when can you start performing artists? When can performing artists start uh, participating? When can arts and culture venues host hundreds of people? We don't know the answer to that. That's what we're trying to build this phased restart plan that might look like, well, here's how you can put 25 people together. And here's how if you're a movie theater, maybe a movie theater actually can open with social distancing in a theater before a concert venue might be able to reopen. And maybe there are ways you can mitigate a concert venue to reopen. So I, I hope people understand that you shouldn't draw major uh, conclusions or assumptions that the summer all is lost because we are trying to find ways to mitigate the risk and get this sector back open because we know how important it is for Vermonters to be able to enjoy a high quality life, but also to uh, keep the economy going. So that's a brief restart conversation. Then we get to this resource uh, recovery center, uh, the website at the Agency of Commerce at accd.vermont.gov. Uh, uh, that is a place where we have three kind of main categories where we're trying to put everything and anything every day that we know on that website. One is directed at businesses. And many of you operate as businesses. I don't mean businesses with a big B as in people that are out to make tons of money and uh, that's all. It's simply people that are operating on a bottom line and, and trying to get into the black. And we're updating information regularly about tools that are available to you. We're asking for economic impacts. Go down the list. The second is communities. Uh, communities have a lot of distinct needs in this crisis, whether it be a lack of tax revenue because people are unable to make tax payments because they're struggling with how to reopen a park, you name it. We're trying to, we have a resource recovery center there. And then the third piece is the individual. And that might be where it comes into you. How do you access unemployment benefits? Uh, what other tools are available for the individual? And so that resource recovery center is stood up and we're trying to help you. The third thing I wanted to uh, touch on real briefly was some of the common tools that are available. Uh, there's been some talk in the chat and in the Q&A about the Paycheck Protection Program. As people may know, this is an SBA product that's uh, offered through the banks uh, through a, a loan, a, a two-year loan with a low interest rate that can be 100% forgivable if it's used on payroll and qualifying expenses. It doesn't work for everyone. We know that. Uh, it's only for eight weeks of payroll and expenses. Uh, but we've heard some success of people accessing this and using it. And we want to be clear, people know that the program is available currently. If you haven't looked at this, you should look at it because the, we, they will run out of money again and it may be the end of the program. I would say we have a couple of weeks left of funding uh, at best. You know, this was a program that was funded uh, more than a half billion dollars uh, by uh, uh, Congress, sorry, more than a, sorry, big numbers, a half trillion dollars uh, by Congress. And that money's been spent. Uh, thousands of Vermont businesses have accessed it. And uh, we're hoping hundreds, if not thousands more, will continue to access it. And the banks and the credit unions are actually beginning to have a, a little easier time accessing the money. There's less of a queue. The Vermont Economic Development Authority just became approved for the maximum loan amount. So you can go to Vita now if you're having trouble finding a bank. I want people to know the program is still there and still available. We know it doesn't work for everyone. The other question is a lot of organizations had applied for the economic injury disaster loan that Jody had mentioned. There's been a lot of uh, stress about this program. More than 4 million businesses and nonprofits applied for the program in the past six weeks. Very few have received any information about their application. This included a 10, 000, up to a $10,000 grant. And at the time they were saying loans up to $2 million for up to 30 years. Uh, that hasn't really materialized. Uh, we do know that hundreds of Vermont businesses and nonprofits have received a portion of that $10,000 advance. Uh, we also know uh, that the loan queue is starting to move. National reports, uh, say that they've capped the loan program at $150,000. We have not received confirmation of that. But if you have, if you're waiting on an economic injury disaster loan, know that you may be capped at $150,000. The third tool that uh, I know a lot of people have looked to is unemployment assistance. 
And just as a reminder, the pandemic unemployment assistance which Congress passed to allow for the first time in the history of Vermont's unemployment program for those that are self-employed and who normally don't pay into the unemployment system and therefore don't get the insurance benefit from the unemployment system, you are now eligible for unemployment. And there's a complicated scenario that the Department of Labor has created an easy tool to help you fill out and figure out if you qualify. And that's a weekly unemployment benefit that could give you up to the state minimum, which is about uh, $900, $800 a, a week in replacement income. That program's alive. Uh, people can use that program. And though there is a slight delay, I encourage you to use it. Uh, they've cleared the backlog of all but 1,000 cases, which sounds like a lot, but out of 90,000, uh, they're making progress. So those are just the, the three things I wanted to hit on. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, and I know that there's uh, a lot of detail we could go into on each of those important issues. Um, and I also know that you have to leave us in a few minutes. So I'm going to um, just pitch one spe very specific question that's come through. I'm wondering, um, there was a, uh, a survey that has gone, has been circulated. It was on the ACCD website. And I think that Champlain Valley Expo was a part of it. Um, and it was uh, audience responses to attending live events post COVID. Are you aware of um, the details of that survey and, and how we might get access to results from that survey? Sure, so yeah, I do believe the Champlain Valley Expo actually led that uh, survey and I think they do plan to compile the results and share them publicly somehow. Uh, the second they're shared, I'll, I'll circulate them out. Great, thank you so much. And again, just reiterating, this is the, the beginning and I look forward to future conversations with uh, of the creative sector and, and um, the great staff at ACCD. And I will uh, reiterate that the ACCD website has um, really great, well-organized information. I'm refer referencing it frequently and sending a lot of, a lot of people there. So thank you, Ted. Um, and now I am delighted to turn it over to Senator Becca Ballin. Hello, hello to all the creatives out there. I'm Senator Rebecca Ballin. I represent uh, Wyndham County and I'm a majority leader in the Vermont Senate. And my understanding is that the pro tem, Tim Ash, might also be on the call. He is a great lover of art and literature um, and you have a lot of allies in the Senate. So I just have a couple simple things that I wanna tell you. One is um, that I live in a house of creatives and my wife is an attorney by day, but she's an aerial fabric artist and opera singer by night. And we had a very low moment this uh, weekend when I came into the kitchen and she said, you know, I just, I just can't wrap my head around the fact that we might not be able to perform, not just this summer, but this fall and maybe not until we have a vaccine. And she said, I just, I can't accept that. It was literally like, I cannot accept that. And I know that there's a lot we don't know about the future. Many of us have a lot of anxiety and fear and the future in moments looks incredibly dark. But what I was reflecting on this morning is that there's one thing that we do know and there will always be art, no matter how bleak things are, no matter how isolated we feel from each other. No matter how odd the post-pandemic world will look, there will continue to be art because that is what saves us spiritually, emotionally, creatively. It's the art that grounds us in our most beautiful humanity. And it's the artists around Vermont that help us find meaning and purpose and hope. So the place that I wanted to start was thank you, a sincere thank you it takes a lot of courage to create and to share your creations with the world. So I wanted to start with a sincere thank you for all of you who are creative and share that with all of us. The other thing I wanna say is Ted did uh, illustrate for you the different um, resources that may be available to you. And one of the things that um, he said was that uh, we do have time, that we don't necessarily have to believe that the summer is gone. But I want you to understand that I, I get it. Like time is not on our side. The, the people who are planning concerts and venues and performances, 
they need months and months in advance and they need resources in order to make those events happen. So the other thing I want you to know is you have allies in the Senate. The Economic Development Committee in the Senate understands that art is a huge part of our economy here in Vermont and it's a huge part of our sense of place. It's one of the things that I love about Vermont, its beauty and its creativity. We're a stronger, much more beautiful state because you're all out there creating and sharing and pushing all of us to be braver. And today I'm primarily here to listen and to say that I see you and I see what you contribute and I feel all of the comfort that your creativity provides for all of us. And I'm also here to say that you need to tell us what you need in this really difficult time. There's a lot we don't understand about what it is to make a living as an artist full time in Vermont. But we're here, we care a great deal, and we wanna see what we can create together and put those supports in place so that we survive not just this pandemic, but any of the emergencies that are in the future. And I wanna thank very much the folks for pulling us together to talk about this because I think it's an element of our economy that all, often is overlooked. So thank you to Karen and Amy and Sarah for pulling us all together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Ballant. Um, I'm happy to turn it over now to uh, Representative Stephanie Jerome. Thank you, Amy and um, Becca and Ted. I think I was certainly gonna fall on your coattails on, on much of what you said, but so I'm a first term legislator and I represent the uh, communities of Brandon, Pittsburgh and Sudbury. And, I have, through my business, I've been part of the creative economy in Brandon for the past 20 years, and I've also been a former uh, Vermont Arts Council board member. So I am fully aware of what's, um, what the issues are. And so I've been deeply in, entrenched in these issues of COVID-19 and how they affect Vermonters, especially, you know, of course, since we've, um, since March, but I've been able to see so much of the problems over the past two weeks. I'm leading an effort with 25 legislators to help uh, Vermonters get their uh, get their unemployment insurance. And folks have been contacting their legislators and, and they're calling us because they have nowhere else to turn. They're so deeply frustrated. And we had a, a, about 2,000 people that our team was working with. And I'm really, really pleased to say that over the past week, we've been able to um, cut that number in half and are working um, with about trying to solve that remaining 1,000. And still that's a huge number, but I feel like you know, together with Department of Labor and this team of legislators, we're able to do so much for Vermonters. So it's, that's one giant piece that I've been working on. And then I, I did wanna also talk about uh, something that my committee has worked on this past year. And I feel like it, it, it absolutely affects artists and it's it's a, a bill for non-compete it was called h1 and uh, our first witness was an artist who came to our committee to talk about um, how she had lost her ability to work because she had signed a non-compete uh, a non-compete agreement and um, because after a number of years her relationship soured with the company that she was working for um, she left the company but and then after she left the company, she realized and that she had signed this non-compete agreement and had lost her ability to now create designs. Um, and she was an artist who was designing uh, products for this company. And after this, uh, she left, she realized that she had no way to earn a living because she had inadvertently signed this bill, uh, signed this agreement. So we worked really hard over the, over the biennium to create uh, a bill that would protect artists and all small business people and employees uh, and from being harmed. And so I just wanted to reiterate that, you know, you're a, you are a business, um, you uh, look at yourself as a business um, and, to, and protect yourself and protect your intellectual property. Uh, it's, it's what you, it's how you earn a living and it's what, um, it's who you are. So I just want, I just really want to make that a, uh, uh, stress that. And then uh, I also want to uh, reiterate what Ted said about, um, about, 
uh, about uh, applying for the, the loans through the programs through the Small Business Administration and also through um, the Vermont Department of Labor for unemployment insurances. Uh, so I think that's about it. I just wanted to just make sure that uh, you do, I guess my parting words are safeguard your intellectual property. It's your employment, it's your profession. Um, and take advantage of all the opportunities that are in front of us right now during this pandemic of COVID-19. As hard as it is, um, please reach out and there are so many ways for people to help you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Representative Jerome. Um, and thanks to everybody. Such uh, thoughtful, important uh, comments in uh, the chat thread and amazing questions coming up. Um, and I want to uh, now turn it over to uh, Paul Costello, who is the Executive Director of the Vermont Council on Rural Development uh, and is also serving on the, the Governor's Economic Mitigation uh, and Recovery Task Force. Paul. Thank you so much, Amy. It's great to be here. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm, I'm leading the Local Support Community Action Task Force that the Governor established towards recovery. We'd love to gather ideas from folks. There's a poll out. If you go to the COVID-19 page at the Agency of Commerce, you can access that poll. We're looking to prioritize ideas that come from communities. We'd love to have more on the table from the arts community. The Council on Rural Development, where I work, um, in 2004 built the Council on Culture and Innovation to make the idea of the creative economy, a household word in Vermont. We saw downtowns all across the state where people think that, that the local arts council, the museum, the library, the, the concert hall were add-ons to prosperity supported by the charity of the businesses. Whereas in fact, these institutions and creators are the foundation of our downtown vitality and the foundation that makes for the essence of what Vermont is. I once went to a, con a conference where Claudio Stern from Brazil, the creative sculptor there, said, art creates emotion which produces citizenship. When you think about the role of the arts, the role of what each of you are doing, you're really establishing a sense of truth for our time. You're challenging the authorities, you're challenging established practice and in the COVID uh, pandemic we need to learn certain lessons around justice, around uh, resilience and the, the arts are the place where culture is made and, and where there's a foundation for the future. So uh, I'd like to hear ideas from folks here but I also you know look to you and, and, I, and to me you know, I feel like we need a poetry of recovery. We need arts and dance that defines resilience for the future, that we need to step from the crucible of this moment to a better place in Vermont. And I know that everyone in the arts community is facing tremendous existential challenges, as my friend from the kingdom says, but you also should know that you're, you're part of the existential foundation of Vermont, the existential foundation of our value as human, human beings. And so I appreciate that. We're navigating uncertainty and we need you. We need you to help find the path and, and help us rebuild uh, who we are as a people. So hard times, <laughs> lots of work we need to be doing, but thank you for your leadership for the future. Thank you so much, Paul. And uh, I think that this is a um, perfect uh, pivot to use uh, an overused uh, word in this crisis, but um, to uh, shift over to a comment that was made um, in the thread that has generated a lot of energy. This notion there's that of what investment in the sector looks like in the face of recovery um, and how we go about investment in individuals and grassroots efforts um, not just short-term project grants, but workforce development, creative partnership opportunities, municipal artist partnerships, and centering equity. And I think that echoes um, a lot of other thoughtful questions in the Q&A, including a question by Senator Ash. Um, so I would like to open that topic up. Um, you know, how do we re-envision and, and get beyond the band-aids um, 
uh, for folks. And so I, I would open that up to, to any of our panelists who, who would like to, um, to address that. Amy, should I go? That would be wonderful. So one of the things that um, I'll certainly follow up with um, Ted Brady, who I know needed to, to go, but one of the things that we're going to be looking at over the next few months is what um, supports could come out of some of the federal dollars that are coming our way. Uh, Vermont got a huge um, portion of the uh, recovery dollars from the federal government. And um, they are time sensitive. They need to be spent by the end of December. But I'll certainly be talking with the rest of um, legislative leadership and with Ted to find out what, what monies might be available in there for investing in the sector going forward. Terrific. Thank you, Senator Vallant. Um, just opened up for any of the other uh, panelists who'd like to reflect on that. Um, that issue and I'll, I'll come back this is Jody to the statement that I had made before which is I think the if our legislators and um, leaders here in the Vermont can recognize the essential nerve, um, nature of what we're doing in our communities and that's both economically but also directly in terms of the response to COVID-19 so um, I, I think almost every organization, every artist that I'm talking about or talking to um, is in some way um, contributing to that response. And since social distancing and all of these mitigation efforts are dependent on folks actually being able to, to stay occupied and stay in a place of good well-being, we are critical to that taking place. As soon as that starts to slide, as soon as there's there's no arts there and no response from our sector, you're gonna see that all of those mitigation efforts are gonna slide the wrong way and we're gonna we're gonna backstep. So I think we are part of that essential response. And if I could just convey that to to our group of leaders to bring back to Montpelier, if we can start thinking about it that way, and then as we start looking at the federal dollars or other funding sources, we should be treated in the same way as those other areas. Thank you, Jody. Um, I'd like to take just a minute to provide some updates from the Vermont Arts Council side uh, about our various recovery efforts and, and make sure um, everyone is aware of what's available on our front. Um, as many of you know, uh, starting on March 25th, uh, we opened up a, a rapid response artist relief grant fund. This was, um, gosh, March 25th seems like forever ago in a lot of ways. Um, uh, the landscape was very different, but we were aware that there were um, uh, many individual artists, creatives, folks who own, uh, had creative businesses um, whose livelihoods were just ripped out from under them. And so these are um, Band-Aid grants, maximum $500. Um, we uh, have uh, thus far um, awarded approximately $100,000 uh, out, uh, and we, we have received approximately 435 applications um, from artists, cultural workers, creative workers. Uh, that grant program, I want everyone to be aware of uh, that two things. One, that grant program, um, the application is, uh, we tried to make it as streamlined and as short as possible, and we tried to make the bar for documentation as low as possible. So we hope that you won't um, be intimidated by this grant application. We're happy to help, and it is open uh, until Wednesday. Um, May 13th. So uh, if you haven't applied yet, um, please do. If you have applied and haven't heard from us yet, know that you'll be hearing from us very soon. Um, so again, that's the, um, the resources for individual artists, um, the relief resources right now. Um, also wanted to make note of the cultural relief grant program. So as you know, as a part of CARES Act, uh, the CARES Act, the uh, National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, each received money to go to the state councils to then subgrant to organizations for relief. And so we're really happy to have uh, pulled together with our friends at Ver Vermont Humanities to make this one grant program, one application. Again, we really tried to make it as simple as streamlined as possible with quick rotation. So folks should not have to wait any more than three weeks at the most um, for these grants. And again, they are primarily unrestricted 
general operating grants uh, based on the size of your organization. They're open to 501c3s um, and also for unincorporated smaller groups who have a fiscal agent, they can apply. Um, those grants are uh, open on a rolling basis. We're reviewing them weekly, but I would encourage you, as you can imagine, we've had a huge response. I would encourage you to prioritize getting those applications in any of those, those organizations. And I wanna take a minute as, as I'm talking about this to highlight um, uh, the fact, that, and this has been brought up by several folks in Q&A and chat, um, those grants do not help for-profit um, businesses. And we are very aware that um, galleries, uh, um, artist collectives, there's many groups um, and, and creative businesses who are not able to access our grant funding. Uh, because the NEA guidelines uh, state that we need to give grants to, to 501c3s, to fiscal agents. So um, I think that is a really important issue that we need to continue to have conversations with and continue to work with ACCD and our other partners on making sure that really important sector of the, of the creative sector is, is getting the help needed. Um, I just want to... Um, also outline on our, some of our regular grants. Uh, we uh, looked at all of our regular grant programs, um, decided where we needed to push out deadlines, um, where we needed to um, keep the deadlines because we didn't want to slow down getting money out the door. Um, so our teaching artist roster, we have opened that up uh, for longer than normal. So we've got um, anyone, uh, even any teaching artists are welcome to apply until July 7th. Um, our cultural facilities grants, which are really important grants that have made um, very important infrastructure investments in our community buildings around the state. Um, those grant, that grant deadline has been extended to July 27th. Um, and then I wanted to mention that arts partners, which is our general operating grants for nonprofit arts organizations, uh, that deadline is this Friday. Um, we kept that deadline as is because again, we don't want to, um, have any delays on getting general operating grants out to the field. So um, those are the updates from the Vermont Arts Council side. And with that, I think I want to move us into, we have 15 minutes left, um, such thoughtful uh, comments and questions. Um, I wanna pitch a question I'm seeing represented in a couple different ways on the thread. Um, and I think that this is probably for um, perhaps uh, Paul and Stephanie and, and Becca and Sarah, um, but anyone's welcome. But um, just this, uh, oh gosh, the, sorry, these questions keep flipping around because <laughs> there's so many coming in. Um, but the issue of, of broadband access and how um, you know this crisis is shining a light on so many inequities and issues in our systems and our cultures and certainly um, the digital divide and broadband access is a big one. And um, we've heard um, uh, some energy around federal funding being used to perhaps address that in Vermont. I wonder if any of our, um, any of our state panelists want to want to chime in on that. I, I'm willing to start. Um, so this, the, this pandemic has certainly brought everything that this digital divide to light, right? And um, we certainly see it because not only are we working at home, but our kids are at home going to school. And uh, we, um, many communities are now working to start uh, uh, communication union districts, and that's been um, noted in, in Wyndham County. And I know that we're thinking about starting one in Rutland County as well, and in, in other county, in Addison and um, Lamoille, and there's in Northeast Kingdom. So it's, it's happening. And as far as um, I know a little bit that about it and that there is some money come from the CARES Act for broadband. So I don't know enough to kind of give you the details of it, but I'm certainly hopeful that Vermont will be in the position that we can, we can get a hold of that money and we can put it to good use. And um, maybe some of the other legislators know a little bit more about it than I do, but I, I think we should, we're, we're, I think we're, we're positioned to go forward quickly now. And thankfully from the, all the work that's been done the past couple of years um, in the legislature uh, to, to organize this effort and to, to move forward. So I, I'm feeling positively about it. And I, I hope that we can um, just jump forward very quickly and, and grab on, onto this movement. 
Thank you, Representative Jerome. Would anyone else like to, to share their thoughts on that issue? I'd just uh, say that the, the crisis we're in makes that question really uh, cogent. It's time uh, for universal broadband service. And I think Congressman Welch is taking leadership at the federal level. Uh, Republican, uh, Representative Tim Brigland is leading work in the House uh, to, to look at long-term solutions. The Communication Union District as a movement is really important and it's connecting with a conversation around working with energy companies, uh, utilities over time to expand services. So we, it feels like we're at a crux point with this conversation and the more that we can all push collectively together towards a universal broadband solution, it, it feels like it's time to do that. The social justice equity issues, the issues around economic opportunity, and then telehealth and the fact that some of our kids are leaving school and are at homes without broadband when they're um, basically cut off from a, a, an equal education. You know, it all comes together with this kind of a crisis to say that it, it's a, 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 a circumstance we have to end. So really briefly, uh, there is actually going to be a joint hearing tomorrow between House um, IT Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, which is the Senate committee that oversees issues such as broadband. We made some good progress last year, and there was a lot of enthusiasm for using this opportunity. As Representative Jerome said, we see all the cracks for telehealth, for education, for artists, for people who are trying to work from home that this is, the, this is the time to get a proposal clear and um, queued up so that we can take full advantage of these federal dollars before it goes away. So there's a, there's a lot of energy focused on that. Great. Thank you all so much. Any other, um, oh, and I see the hand raising function that I'm not um, using correctly. Anyone else want to? <laughs> Sorry, Senator Ballant, you were raising your hand. Uh, anyone else uh, like to chime in on that issue? Is certainly um, it is um, tremendously important for the future of Vermont. Um, I will. Um, pardon me. Okay, I'm going to move to um, another question that I'm seeing come up a fair amount on the Q and A. And again, I'm, I'm welcoming. Um, any, any one of our panelists to chime in on this and attendees feel free to, to chime in with your thoughts on the chat. Um, but um, the issue of, of virtual engagement strategies, we know uh, the creative sector has been uh, really innovative in jumping right in and doing um, some pretty phenomenal virtual engagement um, events and performances. Um, we also know that uh, that's not the same as the regular work of um, so much of our, our downtown and, and small um, arts and creative sector work. So I just wanna open it up um, to folks who have thoughts about um, live streaming, socially distanced performances and, uh, and what it's gonna look like moving forward. Amy, may I say something? Please. Okay. This is an awkward format. I'm not, you're not, not always sure if you can hear each other. So as somebody who um, has worked in the performing arts for 25, over 25 years before joining the legislature, you know, I feel that I, I still have most of my heart uh, left there. So I, and my husband also runs um, a recording studio and my son um, is a 17-year-old musician whose gigs have all been canceled. And so, but I am seeing some really interesting things happening and I don't have a magic eight ball um, or I, I guess, uh, uh, I can't predict the future, but I am seeing some pretty interesting ways that people are able to not just do, you know, live stream events. Cause I think to, to representative Jerome's point, Artists have to be careful to hold on to uh, the value of their work and not where uh, artists are often asked to give their work away free. I mean, it seems like all the time. And, um, and I just, I think that it's the idea of how we can monetize and, but also be part of communities recovery um, as well as being able to earn some money. And I'm seeing some really interesting things. I, 
um, that are happening with the way that artists and arts organizations are going back to the into the vault um, to show film and to show performances. And it's complicated because of licenses and all of that, but it's pretty exciting to see what's hap what's happening. And even my um, you know, my 17-year-old son is is doing something interesting with joining together with other bands to put together essentially a music festival online um, that they're that they're excited about doing. So I'm ex I think that artists are going to lead the way on a lot of this. And if we if there are things that we as policymakers can do to help with um, various things like access to I mean the, the technology and the bandwidth is of of broadband is obviously um, an important aspect of this, but also if there are things that we can do uh, within our within our state laws, I think to support that kind of work, I think um, I think the 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 inclination to support the creative sector is there. Um, but I do think that it's going to be it's going as T Ted Brady mentioned. I do think that the performing arts are going to be most hard hit um, because of the nature of not just the experience of coming together, but also the financial model. You know, you need more people to make things work. So, um, but I hope that people will on this call. It, it sounds to me, um, based on some of the chat and the questions, Amy, that possibly a follow-up webinar about virtual strategies would be a really interesting topic. Um, and I and I hope that that might be possible. Um, Absolutely. This is Jody. I would just chime in that hybrid strategies, I think, are going to be a part of the future. Um, so using the online streaming and the, um, the technology side to engage folks in their place, um, wherever they are, um, but then actually having something physically created or physically performed by those folks in their space. So I, I, again, that kind of hybrid where you, you're maintaining an, an actual interactive experience, not just somebody staring at a screen. Great, yeah, uh, thank you, Jody. Um, I wanna mention that uh, we, I, I think the conversations about virtual engagement strategies is very high on our list of um, next forums to convene. Um, I, we are collecting in our COVID-19 website um, at the Vermont Arts Council, there's a, a page for, for virtual experiences, Vermont virtual experiences, so I encourage you to share them with us so that we can uh, lift up the creative things uh, that you all are doing. Um, we are um, remaining, um, we're five minutes left of time, and um, we have really just a wealth of thoughtful, big, important questions and thoughts. Um, and I am, we are going to be capturing these Q, this Q&A and this chat, and this will inform um, future materials that we're sending out in communications, but also importantly, our, our, next, um, our next series of forums and conversations to go in deep on some of these really critical issues facing uh, Vermont and facing the creative sector. I do want to take a minute and uh, uh, show the next slide, just point folks to some resources. I think it's even the next slide after that. Um, just want to mention our the COVID-19, uh, you know, everyone in the world has a COVID-19 section of their uh, web page at this point for good reason. And so I just wanted to highlight a couple of them in Vermont uh, at the Arts Council. Again, as I've mentioned, uh, resources about new grant programs, how we're changing current grant programs, virtual Vermont experiences um, are all on our website. ACCD, as we mentioned, has really important resources. Vermont Council on Rural Development webpage is excellent. Our friends at Vermont Humanities wanted to make sure that you've seen, uh, we're working hand in hand with them on, on cultural relief uh, and, and getting those funds out. Um, and then I wanted to lift up the Vermont Community Foundation. Uh, They've worked with us to set up an arts recovery fund, and that's in addition to the really important COVID-19 response work that they're doing. Um, so um, you can uh, find both of those things off of their webpage. And I also wanted to lift up and make sure that folks knew that our friends at the Community Engagement Lab are hosting some really interesting forums Tuesdays, the next three Tuesdays um, in May, um, getting at what's next um, uh, for arts. So getting at a lot of these big picture issues that we've been talking about 
um, during the forum and in the, the Q&A and in the chat. Um, so, uh, and I'm seeing another important issue being raised by um, Katie Miller from Inclusive Arts about accessibility um, and what we're thinking about as we unroll everything uh, virtually, how we're thinking about um, captioning live ASL um, and making sure that it's accessible for everyone. That's certainly a vital, um, a vital consideration. And Katie, I think I'm, I'm going to sign you up to help us out with a forum on that because it's really important. Um, as we close, I would like to um, just share out one more poll. You know, I can't resist with these polls if I can um, figure out how to make it work. I think I can. Just one last poll in closing about um, how you might uh, be involved and what you what you might uh, what actions you might take after this this call. So we'll just take a minute and again I'll just um, reiterate to folks we are um, going we are capturing our, this the chat. Um, the really thoughtful things from the Q&A and then those great questions that folks raised um, when you signed up. Um, and we'll be following up and using that to guide us as we go deeper on other conversations. Uh, so folks are, are signing in and, and um, committing to, to future actions uh, to help Vermont recover and to help our creative sector uh, recover. Um, and, um, Let's see, I'm, I'm quite sure that I am forgetting something in our remaining minute and I'll let my, um, my co-pilots chime in and let me know if there's anything I'm forgetting. Um, I'm so grateful for everyone's time. I feel like every, we're probably all experiencing a little bit of Zoom fatigue and video conference overload, um, but uh, you spend an hour and a half with, with us and that means a lot. And again, really thoughtful uh, comments and questions and it's, uh, really apparent that um, this is the beginning of the conversation and we have a lot to, of work to do as a state and, and as a sector. Um, and so with that, I will um, adjourn this meeting. So thank you everyone. We will follow up um, with these resources, with next steps uh, and, uh, and, and check in with you on, on how things are going. Thank you. Um, and I'm just, I'm not going to quite click on in meeting so I don't shut off any of the chats that are coming in, but, um, I'm grateful to everyone. Um, be safe and stay healthy and take good care. <laughs>